how are you? Good. So um, there I am in the upper left-hand corner. So I just want to thank you for having me and Chris and David. And we've been doing the, an IAP course at MIT for three years. And uh, the first time I was at IAP was maybe 40, 45 years ago. And I loved it. And so this is a great honor and pleasure for me to be here today and uh, to talk about leadership and engineering with the case study of the Manhattan Project. So the way I'd like to organize this is as a discussion between David and Chris and I for the first 10 or 15 minutes and then open it up to a question and answer from everybody and then we'll sort of go back and forth. And the assignment usually is before, so I'd like you to watch this film afterwards. I'm a film director and a film professor. And so I've used film for decades in teaching and this particular mini series of seven hours done by the BBC, which won all the awards is excellent. And what we do is we assign this to the students and they look at it with the eyes of leadership at the content. So they see the communication, the structure, the mission, the time, the location, how these decisions were made and what the conflicts were. And in the case of the Manhattan Project, it was very urgent. It only took two and a half years and uh, everybody was worried about who would build the A-bomb first. And there were two leaders, one the actual boss who had the money, who was General Groves, and the other one, the head of science, who had 3,000 scientists working with him, who was Oppenheimer. And these two people were radically opposed in style, character, background, religion, politics. You can't imagine how opposite they are. One believed in open communication, the other believed in compartmentalization. So this is on YouTube, and it's under the name of Oppenheimer. So if you just Google it, you'll see seven episodes. The episodes we use is three, four, and five, which have to do with the mission, the collaboration, the production, the testing, and the delivery. And then finally, when you get to six and seven, it talks about the ethics. And we're going to talk a little bit about ethics too. So my background is as a film professor and as a director, and I've always been fascinated by leadership. I think that teachers are leaders. And uh, in some sense, leaders are teachers. And I use a lot of metaphor. So I ask you as we talk about these things to think about teaching and filmmaking and even cooking as a leadership case study about what happens in a kitchen, even with a small team. It's a temporary system, but there is a shared vision and there is a menu, that's the script, and there are, there's teamwork. So as you go through your next week, take a look at all of these day-to-day -day situations and see how you see leadership happening in front of you and where you see your own strengths and weaknesses, preferences or not, in leadership positions or situations. So now I'm going to introduce uh, Chris and David, who are going to introduce themselves. Uh, Chris is at MIT and David uh, is uh, at Tufts. And um, so Chris, do you want to take it away? Sure. Hi. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, so my name is Chris Babel, uh, and I am the media development director in MIT's Office of Open Learning. Uh, we're the, the people who have been really sort of uh, developing a lot of the online educational tools that are used uh, most probably famously with edX and uh, the sort of the, the massive open online course explosion that happened a number of years ago. But at this point, almost all uh, MIT undergrads also use uh, the tools. Uh, we use them for professional education, uh, of course, open courseware. And uh, my background is also uh, in film. Uh, I'm a filmmaker by training, uh, worked in film and television for a number of years, and have been at MIT for about 15 years. So I have um, sort of a, in terms of leadership, I have a, a mixed uh, background, mixed experience with the arts and also uh, within education. Uh, I, I also teach documentary film at MIT. 
David, are you there? Uh, David? Uh, ab absolutely. Uh, so uh, it's an honor to be uh, with Chris and Andrew, uh, speaking to a global audience on a topic that we have pursued, as Andrew said, in previous IAPs, but also I'm a professor at Tufts in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, although I'm an epidemiologist in terms of my discipline, and, uh, and uh, I lead a, a group uh, at Tufts that is very interested in the ramifications of uh, changes in the environment uh, on population health. So the session that we were just listening to, uh, you know, uh, it definitely um, intersects with the, the work uh, that we do at Tufts. With regards to this course uh, content, uh, Andrew and I also brought some of this into a course that I taught on COVID-19 this summer. And we asked students to think about their own personal leadership styles. And um, I think that might be a good takeaway from today as well. As we uh, discuss leadership, uh, you can also think about the style of leadership that you may have adopted as, uh, as early in your career and then where you are in mid-career or, or at later stages in that. Uh, the other facet that uh, Ed Andrew raised uh, was the, uh, the consideration of the morality of the, uh, of the Manhattan Project. And we certainly would like to hear people's thoughts on that as well. Although our primary focus, I think, in the content that we've explored is on, uh, it is on the, the leadership style of Groves, the engineer, in contrast to Oppenheimer, uh, the scientist. So I'll stop there. Well, it seems like we should take some questions now to give us more energy, our second wind. And um, if people wanna bring in metaphors or uh, references or uh, books that they want to um, recommend or other films, please do. And anybody can email me, uh, a silver at alum.mit, um, and I'll email you the enormous resources we have, but I don't want to really go through them because that's the kind of stuff you can just sort of get on your own and in your own um, rhythm. So, questions from no questions. Well, I'll tell you if there's no questions, then I'll tell you a little story about. Um, leadership and the conditions of leadership and my own personal style. My own personal style as a film director um, is kind of have a shared vision, which is determined by the script. And then to create a climate or a mood, you would say, uh, in which those people who have the shared vision can flourish. And I did a study of, uh, three directors and contrasted their particular leadership styles in film. Now, one I didn't do, but who's terrific at this, is Peter Jackson, who did Lord of the Rings. And when he went to the owner of the rights for Lord of the Rings, he proposed a plan, which actually was the design of the temporary system by which he wanted to make Lord of the Rings. And the vision was, of course, the book, and the membership he thought would be actors from around the world with as few Americans as possible. And the scale was, he said, we're gonna do three movies all at once instead of three movies over five years. And that would reduce the time. And he said, the location will be New Zealand because it's far enough away so nobody well, bothers us. This is like the skunk works or even going to another building in a research facility or Los Alamos in the case of the Manhattan Project. And then of course, the structure of how the communication worked, how the department heads worked together. And of course, what was the mood or climate? So those I would say are the seven variables more or less, and you can smoosh them together, but that's what every leadership project that changes and is flexible and wants to be innovative has to consider as they go forward that they can design those seven conditions. 
And once you realize this is in your power, which is not in your power in what's called a permanent organization, because you have to adapt and become part of that culture, but that you can make a new culture, that gives you a kind of freedom and a freedom with the team that is sharing the vision. So that's why I think one should use other industries as metaphors or other situations to inform yourself about yourself and leadership notions. Um, any questions, any comments by David? Well, uh, well uh, Andrew, Andrew, we have one on the chat from Adam Miller and he is wondering about uh, the work-life balance in a project such as the Manhattan, uh, Manhattan Project in which everyone was working so hard to try to get it done fast and then he asked, and they find, did they find that there was one way to do it that was better or, or at, at attempting to achieve uh, that right balance and the inexorable pressures that they faced, uh, I, I think is also of interest uh, to Adam. So the answer is um, they chose isolation in Los Alamos, complete mm -hmm. compartmentalization. There was a great fear of communist uh, infiltration. And in fact, there was. Um, and uh, the work balance was 99% work and 1%, you know, and um, that was the culture and that's the way it was. And you could do that because it was a short time period mm. and it was an isolated location, which was really isolated. You had to check in, you had to check out, there had to be a reason for it. So if you think about lockdown now, it's nothing compared to being in Los Alamos. And, and, and the, uh, uh, the selection of that location was because of Oppenheimer's familiarity with it as, uh, as a youngster, correct, Andrew? That's correct. He knew about yeah. it, suggested it, but of course Groves approved it because yeah. there were also 10 other locations where stuff was taking place, but they decided to do this one because it had the best of many things. But it's true that um, Oppenheimer had the idea because he loved it and Groves, how can I say? Groves enabled Oppenheimer to have his dream, more or less. Mm. I mean, Groves had built the Pentagon, 10 big projects, and what Groves gave to this project was that it was finished a year earlier or about than it should have been. He was a rush, rush, rush guy. And this of course irritated people who wanted to do things better, more perfect, explore more, th more, more better ways of doing it. But if you think it through, when you have an urgent project, this kind of thing, which is extreme urgency mm. is probably the most important factor. Mm. So even a delay of six months or so on, and also in the plants that Groves was running, because he ran a lot of plants that made the plutonium and the uranium and all this stuff. There he kept rushing everybody too. And he used this idea of compartmentalization and um, isolation and extreme pressure to save a day here, two days there. And in wartime, that is important. And you could say that maybe that was the right decision, that extra pressure. Mm -hmm. No one knows because... No, it only happened once. Yes, it was such a strong exogenous force on the whole thing. Uh, we have another question about the uh, course that uh, has been taught at, at IAP. Um, uh, Chris, would you like to uh, talk about your involvement in that? Sure. Um, so for the last uh, couple of IAPs, we've teamed up, and I think, I, I think it was Andrew's initial sort of uh, idea um, to, to bring... Uh, this the course and it's existed in a few iterations to to um, IAP students, uh, and the idea really uh, it started out with a sort of a broader mandate to look at leadership questions through uh, film, television, theater, and uh, I think it was Andrew who sort of discovered this this one case that is a really terrific example of that. Uh, so the idea is really to get at um, various questions about leadership, leadership styles, the sort of conditions under which you create uh, organizations that are, you know, you need to lead, uh, ethical questions, 
through the lens of the Manhattan Project and more specifically through the, the lens of this uh, mini series uh, that was you know, uh, done a number of years ago. And it's really, um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting kind of way of uh, bringing together an, people. We often get um, a, a really interesting mix of students, both graduate and undergraduate, often people with a certain amount of life experience, uh, people who have been in leadership positions before coming to MIT. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we really just kind of workshop and have a roundtable discussion about questions such as, uh, you know, uh, how do you how do you lead scientists? How do you lead engineers? Uh, not always the easiest thing to do. How do you set up a project so that it will end? Because often, you know, one of the things that I I've learned in my career um, is that it's very very different leading within an organization that has no end versus leading a project that has a definitive end and a definitive goal. Uh, there are certainly overlaps, but a lot of major differences. You know, how do you deal with ethical questions? Uh, how, you know, regarding ethical questions, what about followership? What, I'm sorry, followership versus leadership. Uh, how do you lend yourself, your heart, your soul, your, your talents to a project? Um, and sort of surrender ethical uh, questions that that you know that you you know sort of you you absolve yourself and ask ask your leaders quote unquote to uh, to take them on for you. So it's really a very open ended kind of conversation that we try to have. Um, you know, usually it's just a one session. Uh, we ask people to have watched a couple of the episodes of the mini series in advance, and we also draw on some of the other you know very rich. Uh, literature and very rich media around the Manhattan Project. You know, the Day After Trinity, which somebody just mentioned, mm. the Richard Rhodes book, which is just a fabulous um, history of, of the project. Mm. Yes, uh, that, thanks to Max for a, a long post uh, about uh, the Day After Trinity. Trinity was the location, uh, the code name for the location of the first test uh, of the uh, of the bomb in in the desert of the Southwest. And uh, that I'm not familiar with that documentary, uh, Andrew. Have you uh, seen that one? Yeah, it's terrific. It's um, I think it's terrific. And the, the episodes five, six, and seven of which is the day after the day after are also terrific of the um, of the Oppenheimer film. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot. In this, for these five books that are fantastic that have to do with the wives and the other people there and the people afterwards, the physicists and the military. There's just so much stuff uh, that if you want to get into it, it's about 10 hours of reading, not counting the Richard Rhodes book, which is also 10 hours of reading <laughs> and it's great. So it's endless, um, not endless. It's, there's a lot of stuff there depending on what part of you you want to look at. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so I would say yeah. the main lessons are in that film because you see them, emotionally acted out and highlighted, and then you can go down the paths that are suggested by whatever you're interested in. If you're interested in the activism afterwards, then I would say there's a, there's a better one than the Oppenheimer one, but there's, there's a good one for each of the aspects of, of this fantastic project, which is there's a lot of lessons in, you know, and there's a lot of projects that are like this, and there's a lot of um, future projects that are gonna be like this. And, one of the things that's missing today is we don't look back on how these things are funded, controlled, led. Because if you think about it, we didn't think at all about the vaccine. Now, we can't just blame it on one um, administration, but in general, when you look at lots and lots of, of uh, projects, there is not a lot of thought about the design, the membership. It isn't thought through the same way as building the Pentagon was thought through as an example, mm. which is also a temporary project. So this is, I think, the importance of, of bringing these subjects up about leadership of temporary projects. Some are more urgent than others because we can learn from all of these, the mistakes and, the, and really what worked. Mm -hmm. mm. So I, I am uh, continually astonished that we don't look to the past to see how people organized the work and the workflow, 
the leadership, the transition, the moving in and, out, in and out of the permanent organizations. I mean, how did all these people go back to universities? Why didn't we use more universities in future projects? Why, you know, why, 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 why? And of course, there's always a different answer for a different project, but it, it needs a lot of thought in the design project. And as they say in filmmaking, you know, it's all in the script, but in the script is also the membership because the script is what brings the people together who are actually gonna make it work, who are gonna collaborate. And that's why it's important to spend a lot of time on the pre, pre, pre production. Mm. And while these are a good example or theater um, or cooking even, because you gotta buy the stuff and find the fresh stuff. Um, <laughs> for examples of how you actually do these things successfully and within budget and within a time budget. Mm. So the, somebody asked the question about time budget versus perfection. And I think the, the answer of a temporary project is time trumps. That's, that's I, I don't want to use that word, so time, time is more important. Because <laughs> uh, that's the whole definition of temporary. You're in a, the reason you're doing it that way is because you think you can do it faster than in the permanent organization, which is full of politics and uh, can I do this and why can't I do that and that stuff. The, the whole idea of a temporary organization, like a film or the Manhattan Project, is to get it out of the permanent structure, which mm -hmm. is full of delay. So my answer is time is the most important thing in an urgent project. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the th one of the things you mentioned, Andrew, was going back and 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 revisiting some of these previous structures and decisions, and, and that. Has, has played out rather well in terms of uh, the 1918 uh, uh, influenza, right? The, the, the Great Influenza is just a wonderful book, uh, high, uh, highlighting some of the same issues that we're dealing with in uh, the current pandemic, uh, social distancing, the wearing of masks, the urgency of, of following uh, public health measures, basic public health measures. So you, you can go back and look at some of this stuff. We, we have a good thought question, uh, not really a thought question, a contextual question. How do uh, we see leadership having changed over the years? What, what's different about leadership now? I think what say, changed is that the old model of leadership, older, say a hundred years ago, in the spectrum, of leadership styles was more based on the Prussian system and the Roman system of military. Mm -hmm. So it's taken a long time to get through this, to get past this chain of command idea. So I would say we're now much more into participatory leadership than we were say a hundred years ago. Now, obviously within the realm of various companies, even big companies today, they have different climates and different structures and different I mean, Larry Ellison's way of leadership is different than Steve Jobs. So it's not that the time has made everybody uh, more participatory, but I would say in general, that's what's happened in the last hundred years. We went from very heavily uh, influenced by the military and the bureaucracy um, to what we have today, this sort of mixed, mixed leadership styles. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Chris? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how much direct experience I have. Uh, well, I guess my career is long enough that I have a fair, a fair amount of historical experience. Um, I, do, I do think that there's more, more fluidity. Um, I think that the sort of the rise of the entrepreneur uh, in, in, in certainly technical fields and, um, you know, uh, digital digital entrepreneurs, the internet, uh, computers, both hardware and software, I think has raised a lot of new sort of forms of leadership and popularized a lot of a lot of sort of more, as I said, more fluid leadership styles than you might have seen in the past. Um, you know, things like agile development certainly have a, have had a, a major impact and a major impact, I think, beyond just software development. So, so I would say that that is something that I've seen uh, to a large degree, although I, the caveat there in terms of my own direct experience is that when I was really young, I was working on independent films and things like that that are always chaotic and fluid. So, you know, in some ways, like going from that kind of really, really 
chaotic and fluid environment into a more academic environment, you know, for, for me personally, I've seen a little bit of a, a different trend, but I think that that's more my own uh, personal experience rather than a, than a societal trend. Let me ask, answer a, a question in another way, which is when I start any film project, and of course the people who come into this film project come from a wide variety of other films that have different leadership styles. So when we sit around the table, say the actors and the writers, the DP, all the, the key department heads, I usually take their glasses and I put it, take them away from them, put it in the middle of the table and put it in a kind of circle. And then I put me in the center and I say, and they take the glasses from particular people, from everybody. And I say, the leadership style is like this, you know, it connects like this and then you connect with this and you, so they see it visually and we're all around there and everybody sees it at the same time. This lets everybody know it's this kind of organization as opposed to the one they went to before or the one they went to before or the one they went to before. One of the things that screws up, and this was in the Oppenheimer too, um, Oppenheimer was not clear in the interest of recruiting all the people he wanted. He was a little sketchy about how it was really organized and who would do what and who would be the chair of this and the boss of that. It's got to be very, very clear when you're working with creative people or innovative people of what is the communications, the leadership structure, all of that. And you can't change it because this is part of the deal. It's not just the money or the shared vision or when you show up. And when you leave, it's really, how are we going to all work together? Because every temporary system has a different set of rules and therefore a different climate and a different personality of the leader. So no matter what Elon Musk says, you see what he does. You know, that's, that's, that's the reality. Um, and I think this is really important when you're looking to get the best people and keep them for the whole show. In the case of film and theater, it's very ca catastrophic if somebody leaves in the middle of a show. Mm. They feel like you were truthful with them in the beginning. So that's what I think is a very clear, whereas in permanent organizations, that's somehow they learn it along the way as opposed to being told at the first dinner. Mm -hmm. So getting back to food. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and shopping. <laughs> <laughs> and and I haven't cooking. read any more. Um, quite, by the way, there's another one, um, another uh, half hour after this, which is about streaming leadership. And um, so if anybody's interested in streaming and how that works, um, stay tuned. So mm -hmm. what's, next, what's next, David? Well, let's see. Uh, we have three minutes left, Andrew. Well, so why don't you sum it up? Uh, so, well, uh, I was just wondering if, if there were any other further uh, comments. There, there was a question about Operation Warp Speed, and uh, Operation Warp Speed uh, allowed for uh, the development of now these two, uh, two vaccines that have been approved in the U.S. A third candidate, J&J, &J, is awaiting approval over the next couple of weeks. Um, it's a very interesting uh, uh, sort of structure imposed there of having different companies being funded uh, by the U.S. government to uh, essentially press ahead with production of the vaccines even before their efficacy and safety were fully understood. And so it was, uh, it, it was a sense of urgency about uh, attempting to bring this forward. So uh, just by by, by closing out, I, I think what we've uh, considered is uh, leadership style, uh, the structure, particularly of uh, temporary projects, of, of time-limited projects. Uh, one of the things I always tell my students is I'm, I'm, I'm enamored of the academic calendar because there's a beginning and an end. <laughs> Many things in life uh, aren't usually truncated in that way. Chris, I'm wondering if you have any final words. Uh, no, I think this is. I think this has been been really interesting. I I would say that um, I would just emphasize the importance of having an end. Mm -hmm. Me, that's an extremely valuable tool to have as a leader. Uh, that and you know the beginning part, which is the goal. You know, here's my goal, and here's the end point. Uh, and and you know, and here's how we're going to wrap things up, so that you don't have this these zombies that kind of you know stagger on forever and ever without a <laughs> and uh, any way of killing them. Uh, and, and so, and so, and, and so that our, our session doesn't stagger on like an 
like a zombie. Uh, Andrew, would you like to uh, bring it to a final close? Uh, I'm just thrilled to be to be here. I think that um, that any project, even in the Manhattan Project, can be divided up into various chapters along the way, whether it's testing, delivery. So if you think about whether well, it was the collaboration, the production and the experimentation, and then it got to the testing. And then after that, the membership changed the actual delivery of the project. And this is important to sort of think of the whole, from Groves's point of view, the project was not ended when they built the bomb. He had to worry about getting it from here to there and then on the yeah. plane, and then there's somebody had the plane to Japan. And at each stage, you can change the membership and you can change the kind of organization you have. So by the time it was tested, it then went into an extremely authoritarian organization run by Groves. The scientists had nothing to do with it after that. So yep. by realizing that you have the freedom, if you take the mind that you're Groves, to break it up into little chapters is really important. And Groves did have that because he'd done so many buildings on canals and endless things. So he was really experienced in getting these things done and delivered as opposed to, let's say someone who's more relaxed mm. at Berkeley. Yep. So that's what I think is important. Dividing it into chapters and giving it to someone who, who wants to deliver it. Yep. Well, th thank you so much, Andrew, Chris, and David for that wonderful talk. And